Hello, Year 11. Uh, missing you all, of course, at the minute, and I hope you're all working very hard. Now, what I want to do with you today is I want to go through then the ecology section, okay, the ecological relationships and energy flow section. I know some of you are having uh, great difficulty trying to fill in the different parts. It is very hard to fill in that, that handout, but hopefully if you listen well for the next few while, you'll know a bit more about it and hopefully we'll fill some parts in. Okay, so let's start then. Now, ecology is obviously all to do with organisms and where they live. I know that, that a lot of you in year 11, you went through the first few uh, slides we're going we're to be looking at then today, but just want to kind of go back to the start here a little bit then and talk about a bit about ecology then. Now in this unit, you're going to have to learn lots of different definitions. Some of which you will have heard of before, some ones you might not have heard of before. We started one of the first ones in, the uh, one is called population. You've heard about the population of the world, of course. And uh, this population is, is quite specific, okay? It's the number of organisms of, of, uh, of the same species uh, living in the same area, okay? So again, in, in exams and in tests, you need to mention the same species and also mention living in the same area. So that's population. So you could have a population of spiders in a forest, you could have a population of, of uh, minnows in a pond, but it must be the same species and it must be living in the same area. Now, leads on, of course, the habitat. The habitat is simply uh, where something lives, whether it be a forest or the desert or a pond or even sometimes on a leaf. It just simply means where, where an organism lives, okay? Also, we have a community. Community is slightly different Community is then a, a lot of, of different populations together. So say it might be, for example, all the spiders and ladybirds and slugs and butterflies and, and uh, beetles and everything else in, in a particular area then. So that's what we call community. As in a community center and a placement of a community center where everybody gets together. Well, community is all of the different populations all in one particular area. Now, other ones we have, one it's, it's it's quite difficult to understand sometimes is biodiversity. If we think of it somewhere maybe where there's very, very low biodiversity, somewhere like, like the desert, there aren't that many things which can live there. Okay, so again we have a quite a low biodiversity. And then of course somewhere like the jungle, there's a very high biodiversity. You've got lots of different plants, lots of different animals, and therefore you have a high biodiversity. So it's a measure of the different species living in an area. It's not just the number of plants, because it could all be the same plant, like in a farmer's field, for example. There's quite a low biodiversity because it's the same crop growing. Uh, whereas it needs to be then lots of different plants and animals and lots of different organisms all living in the same area and also a large number of them. So that's what we mean by biodiversity. Okay, of course, they're affected by the environment. That's things such as the 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 uh, rainfall and, and also what, what else lives there. So again, we can kind of break it down into two different parts. We can break it down into the abiotic factors and the biotic factors. The abiotic, first of all, that's, that's things which are not alive. Biology is study of living things, so abiotic is something which is not alive then. So abiotic factors are things such as temperature, humidity, uh, intensity, uh, light intensity, all that kind of stuff would all be things. Those, those would all be abiotic factors then. Then, of course, we have the opposite, which is a biotic factor. This is a living factor. So things such as as many predators there are there, uh, what prey there is to eat, those are all examples then of biotic factors then. So the environment's kind of a mixture then of the abiotic factors and also the biotic factors. So that's a few different definitions and over the, over the course of the next maybe five, 10 minutes, we'll, we'll learn more about then these different uh, definitions then. Now, one of the things we, we couldn't actually do, my sampling is where we, we try and get an idea as to how many plants and animals and other creatures uh, there are in a particular area. Now, to do that, there's a couple of things we use. Now, uh, if we are studying then plants, then what we'd use is we'd use things, I guess we'd use quadrats. Now, quadrat is something then which you're going to see it looks a bit like this here. So this here is a quadrat. Now, a quadrat then is something then which is lots of little squares. Now, quite often what we would do is you would use a quadrat then which, which is one meter uh, long and one meter high then. What we do then, say we wanted to find out how many, many weeds there were in particular field, for example. What we might do then is we might then uh, measure, first of all, how long a field is, measure how, how, how wide a field is. 
And what we need to do then is we need it to, to, to randomly take a sample then of, of uh, weeds in this field then. So what we're doing in fact then is we, we, we've marked out then the actual then width of the field, we've marked out then the length of the field. Uh, and what we need to do is we need to have coordinates and coordinates where we could actually go and put this this quadrat device down then. Now to, to make sure we don't we're not biased about the results, we do is we do it then randomly then. So we need to do need some way of working out then a random place then to put the quadrat down. What we're gonna do is we can go to a calculator, we can type in the random number function on the calculator, we can use that then to work out coordinates, and then what we're gonna do is we can walk then to that part of the field. We can put the quadrat down, we can see how many weeds there are in that particular quadrat then. We might do that 25 times and therefore get 25 sets of results. What we can then do is we can then work out the average number of weeds per quadrat. So say we get an average of six weeds per quadrat. Then we do have to multiply them by the amount of times that, that quadrat fit would fit into the whole field. Now the more results we take then the more representative it, it is. Okay, but certainly it takes time, so we can't have can't spend all day measuring results. So we need to give ourselves a bit of time. But the more results we can get, then the more representative the, the actual information is in. And that's how we kind of work uh, work out a quadrat. So work out the amount randomly put down the quadrats, you work out how much there is per quadrat, and then you multiply by the amount of times that quadrat would fit into the entire field then. Again quadrats work well. If we want to use if we want to maybe see how how the distribution of, of plants changes. You use a thing called a belt transect. Now, a belt transect is something like this. It quite often works well at a beach where, where uh, we used to do it then, where you'd, you'd kind of look at the seaweed then in, in different parts of the beach. What you can do is you can kind of put a tape measure down, kind of from near the water's edge to up, up then towards the, the road, really. What you do is you put the tape measure down, and then what you do is every few meters, and what you do is, is say it's every five meters, for example, Put the quadrat down, you see then which seaweed you find in, in those different quadrats. And it shows a good distribution of how the actual, how the plants are found then. So you might find, for example, a certain kind of seaweed lives closer to the water and a certain kind of seaweed lives further away from the water then. So again, it kind of shows a good, if there's a trend, for example, the belt transect should pick it up then. So say we, we put the tape measure down, you put the quadrat down maybe every, every five meters, for example, and you kind of see then how distribution changes slightly then. That's that's our belt transect. So let's which you will have seen before about these food chains and the food chains here again. There's different terms we we need to remember in terms of food chains. First one is an is a nice easy one. It's producer. Okay, so there's my producer there. It of course can produce its own food then using sunlight. Now sunlight is a source of energy. It doesn't matter what kind of food chain it is. The sunlight is always a force of energy then. Now that plant of course the plant needs. Uh, some energy then to respire. It's going to need some fruit for growth. It's going to need some for some we loss as leaves and things fall off. So again, the actual plant needs then lots of energy. But only a small amount of that energy gets passed on into the next stage then. Now, uh, this next stage then is called then the second trophic level. I should just say then that the plant then is a first trophic level. Trophic means feeding. So first trophic level, second trophic level, third trophic level. Okay, also called then uh, tertiary is trophic level, fourth trophic level, also called quaternary uh, trophic level as well. And this this then leads on when everything dies in the end, of course, to get broken down by decomposers. We'll come back to those later on. So we're saying that energy, of course, comes from the sun, it's taken in by the plants, they make food, that food gets passed on to the next animal, it gets passed on to the next one, gets passed on to the next one. And when they all die, of course, they get broken down by these decomposers. Now, a question we ask in exams all the time then is, is what does the arrow represent? Now, you can simply say the flow of energy. It's kind of the easiest way to explain it. You can say things such as uh, what eats what, and I, the, the mouse in this case eats the plants. But again, it's easier remember just to say the flow of energy. So food chains. Now, if we go on, you're going to find we, may, we need to have some energy calculations in terms of food chains. So you might get something which looks a little bit like this in the exam as well here. If we think here, you need to look to see how energy is being lost here. So if we have a look here, maybe energy is coming in, there's 1000 joules of energy coming in here. And what happens in fact then is that most of that energy then uh, is, is simply either bouncing off the leaf, it could be, it might be passing through the leaf and not hitting the, hitting the, the chloroplast in the leaf. So a lot of energy then is simply which is coming towards the sun is being wasted then. Now if, however, if then, 
it takes in energy, okay, it's just taking in energy here, it's taking in, let's say for the sake of argument, that it does take in, in fact, then 1,000 joules of light energy. Now, most of that light energy then is going to be wasted. It can't get passed on. So we're sending here 990 joules. Most of it is being lost then uh, to the environment in different ways, whether it be it's respiring, for example, or else it might be simply then producing seeds and the seeds being passed away. Leaves fall off. All those kind of things are all being lost to the environment. So only a small amount, normally about 10% of the energy is getting passed on then to, to the next animal then. There's only 10 joules getting passed on here. Now that that deer there, uh, again, it needs it for lots of different things. It needs it for to generate heat, for example. Okay, it needs it to. It's going to lose some by excretion when it poos and pees. Um, some will be lost then simply in movement as well. There's lots of ways in which this this animal needs uh, needs energy. Okay, only a small amount of energy is being used to actually grow and build up new new tissue. So of the 10, 10 joules being taken in here. Only about then 1% can get passed on to the lion in this case then. So you can see pretty quickly then, we are losing energy uh, quite rapidly as we move up this food chain. Normally what happens in fact is we only really have food chains of maybe three or four organisms in length because there's so much energy being lost between each level of the food chain. So again, you might get questions about, about energy calculations. Now you'll, you'll do different examples of those in, in the past paper questions. You might be asked, for example, what percentage of energy can get passed on? If we think percentage-wise, well, what percentage can get passed on then to the next one here? If it's taken in 10 joules, only one, one get passed on. So there's going to be then one divided by 10, multiplied by 100, can get passed on then. Okay, so only we're really saying here is only 10% can get passed on then. So again, you're going to have quite calculations like that then. Now, food chains are, are quite a simplistic way of describing what happens in nature. Normally, of course, it's not just one food chain. In a particular area, you might find in lots of food chains working together. So again, we have another simple one here. Now, there's a few important things when we plot these food webs. So food web simply is a combination of food chains which are put together here. Now, uh, in terms of these food webs, what happens in fact then is the ones then on the bottom line. So if we kind of draw a line across here. Those are the producers. Let's put a big P here. Those are the producers. The next one up, the next level up here, they're then going to be the primary consumers. Okay, so basically they are the things then which eat the, the plants. So they're of course are herbivores. So we've got primary consumers here. Now then after that you have then what's the, the third level of the tertiary consumer. Okay, that, that's going to be in fact here. Is our tertiary consumer. And then we have at the very top we have then our, we call our quaternary consumer. Or simply, we can simply call it top consumer. So this can be called top consumer here. Then. Now, you might be asked questions about food webs. One of the things you're asked about, for example, then, is you might be asked then, what happens if one of the animals dies off? If we take an example like like this see here, let's kill off this dragonfly nymph. Okay. Now, if we kill off this dragonfly nymph, that means, of course, then the brown trout then, the brown trout then, well, they might decrease in number because they've got less dragonfly nymph to eat. And therefore, they might get hungry, they might die off. And what also might happen though, is if you kill off the dragonflies, then the brown trout then might eat more maidfly nymph, and it might eat then more of these freshwater shrimp. Now, freshwater shrimp are be eaten by both of these two things then. Okay, so again, let's think for the most obvious things here. If we kill off a dragonfly nymph, well, the number of brown trout might decrease because there's less to eat. But certainly the mayfly nymph would also then decrease because the brown trout Brown trout is, is eating it instead then now. So again, there's lots of things which can happen then with, with, with food webs. Try and be precise though. Make sure you say things such as the brown trout numbers would decrease because they've got less food to eat. So we always be quite specific here. So we've mentioned food chains, we've mentioned food webs. Let's think of another area. Okay? An area which, which if you've been filling in the notes, you're going to find uh, it's quite confusing in the notes here. So let's think food pyramids then. And really there's two kinds of food pyramids. Uh, one is called then the pyramid of numbers and one of those is called the pyramid of biomass. And look at both of these two things in turn then. Pyramid of numbers first of all then. If we think about food chain, okay food chain of course shows uh, simply what eats what. Okay but now we have to think about then how many of each thing has been eaten here. 
So what we can do is we can start to plot then what's called a permanent of numbers. So we have an example here. Here we have our, our permanent numbers here. So we, we have, if we think have at the bottom here, we've got our producers, okay? A simple food chain, of course, you go producer, to snail, to thrush, to sparrowhawk. So we've distantly turned them outside here then, okay? Now, you're going to find it that there will be lots in of clover being eaten. So therefore, this big bar here represents then lots of clover. Snail, again, there's going to be some snails, not as many clover, not as many snails as there are clover, but certainly we've got the snails here. So again, we're going to have a smaller bar for the snails. Then thrush, are going to be, not going to be as many thrush eating the snails, so therefore it's going to decrease again. And then last of all, of course, we've got the spiral hawk, which might only be one of these things at the, at the top here then. So we have our, our permanent numbers here then. Now, normally, really, the bars wouldn't be quite as wide as that, but you kind of get the, get the general idea here. Now, there is a problem, however, with permanent numbers. Now, sometimes we get an odd shape permit, okay? If we take an example of, of a tree, now, certainly lots of different animals can live on one tree. So, it looks a bit like this then. So, you've kind of got one producer, you've got then lots of primary consumers, and you've got then your secondary consumers. I can see quite clearly here, it's not a permit shape anymore. And so, it's quite confusing. And therefore, scientists what quite often then what they'll do is they'll plot a different kind of permit, and they'll plot what's called a permit of biomass. Permit of biomass then is is the total mass at each level. So if we think here is a massive oak tree, there's there's only one oak tree, but it has a very large mass then. Now, if it was, let's go back to a different example. If we go back then to the previous example with the clover, the clover then would need to be then you need to find the mass of all of the clover. Okay, so count, get all the clover, find the mass of each individual clover, and then multiply the individual mass by the total number of clover. So you can see we've got then the total mass. So in this case here, we the total mass of oak tree at the bottom of this pyramid of biomass. Then you've got the caterpillars. You need, you need in theory then to, to count all the caterpillars and also find the mass of one individual caterpillar. Then we've got then the birds here. Sorry, we've got the birds here. And also we have, of course, you've got the fox in this case here at the top then. Now, permanent biomass is, is normally in 99.99% in of the time is this permit shape then, okay? So again, it, it does kind of give a better idea as, as to where this energy is coming from if we use a permit of biomass. But there are some big disadvantages of a permit of biomass. One of the questions you could is asking you to compare the permit of, permit of biomass with the permit of numbers. And therefore, you might need to know something like this then. So what it shows, well, we've mentioned before, the permit number shows the number of organisms at each trophic level, each feeding level. Permit by mass shows the total mass. So if we had the individual mass multiplied by the number. So the total mass of organisms at each trophic level. Advantage is permit by mass, it's quite easy. Okay? You, you can kind of count the number of, of grass quite easily. You can count maybe the number even of, of spiders quite easily. Uh, so again, we, we can then measure these things quite easily. Okay, but again, it doesn't allow for some the fact that some things are much bigger than other things. Whereas a permit biomass does take size into consideration then. Permit biomass is not a permit shape. Permit biomass, a permit number, sorry, isn't a permit shape. Whereas permit biomass uh, is then a permit shape then. Only big problem with permit biomass is now the amount of water in different organisms could be quite different. So for example, if you're measuring then the, the mass of grass, on a dry day, a dry sunny day, there wouldn't be as much water in the grass as there was then on a very wet day. So the water con content can change quite a bit. So to allow for that, what would happen in fact then is we need to dry out the different samples. Now we need to dry out the grass samples. We also need to dry out the animal samples. So therefore to plot a parameter of biomass accurately, you need to dry out the different animals. That means of course you need to kill the different animals. So therefore then it's, it's much harder to measure the permit of biomass. That's the difference between the two then. So we've mentioned so far food chains, we've mentioned food webs, we've mentioned then permit numbers and permit of biomass. Let's go on to something else. Okay, let's go on then now on to nutrients. So again, if we think here, um, one of the films in fact then, which which I'm watching at home at the minute actually is, is The Lion King. And in The Lion King then, there is a famous song about the circle of life. And the whole idea of nutrient cycles is to do with the circle of life then. 
we think here about anything which which, which dies of course well when it dies it gets decomposed okay that might be bacteria it might be fungus but it decomposes here and what happens is that the actual nutrients built up in the the decaying uh, animal in this case here is is being broken down and those nutrients are being released back into the soil again then so that's that's what we mean by this these kind of cycle of nutrients and it gets starts off gets built up as you move along the food chain but as animals die they get recycled again and put back into nature again then now we said decomposers kind of carry out this this final step then now if we want decomposition to take place it, they need to have heat they need to have oxygen they need, need to have water okay there's a term there which which we use in, in terms of decomposers called saprophytic nutrition so again it's kind of a hard word to, to, to spell but this saprophytic nutrition is here then now what does that really mean well again it kind of talks about then how then we can then decompose these different animals now once they're decomposed they'll form humus but again let's go back then to think more about this idea of saprophytic nutrition so let's, let's take the example of this um these mushrooms then which are growing then on this this algae in fact then basically what we have is we've got some kind of this could be at the bottom here we could have maybe leaves which have been falling off the trees land in the soil the moss and also then the fungus in this case and also bacteria will start to start to break it down then so what does it do if we think about the actual then uh mushroom here what it does in fact then is this part here at the bottom of this part here what happens in fact is we have enzymes being released what happens is the enzymes and the enzymes then they start then to be released into here and what happens in fact is it dissolves and dissolves the the leaves and what it does in fact then it dissolves the leaves and then what happens is the actual then dissolved food then gets sucked back up into it again then okay so we're saying here that we are releasing enzymes enzymes then dissolve the food and then they suck up the liquid food again then so again this is what happens and again we've we mentioned that forms humus uh, humus is kind of organic material which makes the, the soil nice and nutritious for the plants to grow again then so that's that for nutrition all right we've mentioned nutrient cycles now we really need to think about two main ones carbon cycle and also the nitrogen cycle carbon cycle is easier of the two so let's discuss it first of all then so i'm going to show you a little diagram here which kind of shows in the carbon cycle now again we, we, we know already a bit about the carbon cycle we know of course that inside the air we've, we've got then carbon we should say carbon dioxide really i should say up here then okay so again we've got a, a big supply of carbon dioxide in the air now if we think about things putting carbon dioxide into the air well certainly combustion when you burn things and you burn coal in your house for example or maybe burning coal in a, in a, in a fire in a power station or even maybe uh, when you're burning then um petrol or diesel in the car these are all fossil fuels and when you burn all these things what happens is they put carbon dioxide into the air also animals when they respire putting carbon dioxide into the air when things are being, being decomposed they're also putting carbon dioxide into the air and even plants particularly during the night when they're respiring uh, they are putting then carbon dioxide into the air okay don't forget plants respire all day every day but at night time there's more co2 being given out than being taken in so we're saying that combustion and also respiration both putting carbon dioxide into the air now the only thing taking carbon dioxide into the air is in fact then photosynthesis so the plants then are taking in then carbon dioxide for photosynthesis they're using that the carbon and the carbon dioxide then to build new tissues whether building new carbohydrates uh, building new starch for example also being added to other substances to make protein so you can, the actual plant then will take in this this carbon dioxide and use it then to make glucose and make starch and make cellulose and basically use it to, to build things up then and of course then the plants whether it be a tree whether it be the grass here uh, that carbon then has been taken into the to, to the animals when they eat the plants and then of course the animals will use it to build up their own carbon inside there some of the carbon though however has been put back into the air during respiration then so we have a carbon cycle again it's a very important cycle we know of course then that things can go wrong with this cycle we really want to keep the amount of carbon dioxide in the air reasonably constant okay at the minute then it's about 0.04 percent of the air is carbon dioxide now again that doesn't sound that much but again it does have very serious consequences 
particularly if we increase then the amount of carbon dioxide. Let's think first of all though about the importance of this carbon dioxide. So now we have of course around our earth we have then an atmosphere. Here's our atmosphere kind of right here then. That atmosphere is very very important. If there were if there was an atmosphere there what would happen in fact is the earth be too cold. So we need to have some of this some of this gas in around the earth then. Now uh, if we think about what happens and what how this this helps well here we have then some energy coming in from the sun okay this radiation is coming from the sun it comes through here something's going to in fact bounce straight off the atmosphere okay but something's going to come into the earth and start to heat up the earth then now some of the heat will escape okay but what happens in fact is some of the heat then gets kept in by the atmosphere it gets kind of bounced back and forth inside the atmosphere here then the problem is however is that if we have too many greenhouse gases, too much, too much carbon dioxide, for example, methane is another big one. With too many of these gases here, what happens is the, the kind of layer, the, the kind of layer you can think of it is getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And the thicker this layer gets, then, then the more, the more heat gets trapped. And the more heat gets trapped, of course, then the hotter the Earth actually becomes. So even a very small change in the amount of these greenhouse gases will have a, a very serious consequence then on, on the Earth then. Again, we all know a few of these a few pictures here to remind us here. Again, if it's if we are burning if we are burning lots of trees down, for example, chopping a lot of trees down, we're putting more carbon dioxide into the air. If that happens, then well, some areas will will have uh, a lot then of of drought. Okay, the deserts in fact would get bigger. Okay, does get bigger. What happens in fact as well is we're going to have then. A loss of habitat okay here's an example of a, of a polar bear maybe not quite as bad as this all the time but we have a polar bear here if, if those ice ice sheets are melting of course he's not going to have as much much place to live and to hunt okay and also of course as they melt then of course what also happens is the water levels would start to increase that's going to go into to problems with with lots of low-lying areas where we've got lots of flooding taking place also lots of flooding and also lots of hurricanes or tornadoes lots of extremes of weather as well and so again lots of problems will happen if global warming takes place and if we're not careful with the amount then of of carbon dioxide we put into the air then now what can we do how can we kind of reduce warming which takes place well one of the big things is plant more trees now uh the minute then across the world we, we are trying to tr trying to, to plant more trees particularly in western countries who are planting more trees uh, Donald Trump for example talked about how he wants to plant then one trillion more trees and, and across the UK as well we are trying to plant more and more trees why because the trees of course they take in carbon dioxide so one thing is plant more trees obviously the opposite thing of that is is to not chop down as many trees uh, the minute of course across the world we are chopping down lots and lots of trees every single year then so we plant more trees don't chop down as many trees and also as well try not to use as many fossil fuels if we think here then this is a coal part uh, coal part uh, uh, coal fired sorry power station as we're getting electricity from this station of course we're using up then lots of fossil fuels if we can use other sources like like hydroelectric power and tidal power wind power and even nuclear power we're not using up as many fossil fuels and therefore we're not producing as much carbon dioxide then so you can try and use use fewer fossil fuels that might be even, that could be as well be then uh, we're using public transport rather than using cars all the time. And we're using a bike and we're walking somewhere instead of actually then using, using your car then. All different ways in which we can try and reduce the amount of CO2 going into the air. So that's kind of a bit about the carbon cycle. Right, the tricky one though is, is the nitrogen. So here we have the nitrogen cycle. Now this is one of the most difficult things you'll study this year. It's also one of the things which pops up most in the exams. Now, uh, there are a few basic things to remember in the, in the carbon in the nitrogen cycle. Uh, first of all, we can say that we have in the air we've got the nitrogen gas. So we know that with four fifths of the air is nitrogen. Now, even though the plants need nitrogen, and even though the animals need nitrogen, they can't take it in from the air. Uh, nitrogen is in fact is, is important to make proteins and also important for making DNA and uh, they can't take it in from the air they need to take it in, in a different form now plants first of all they take it in in the form of nitrates 
So a lot of the nitrogen cycle is how we can convert the nitrogen gas in the air into nitrates in the soil. So let's have a look at some ways in which that's done then. So the most obvious way maybe is uh, through then a bacteria called nitrogen fixing bacteria. Now if you put your hands on soil, you're gonna find inside there you've got lots of bacteria and one of those kinds of bacteria is called nitrogen fixing bacteria. What does it do? Well, it actually takes nitrogen gas from the air and converts it into nitrates. Now, some plants, in fact, some plants have an advantage because what happens is they have then what we call root nodules. And those are kind of swellings around the roots of these plants then, which contain lots of this nitrogen fixing bacteria. What happens then is that the, the bacteria, it gains nutrients from the plants, but also the plants gain nitrates from those bacteria. So you're both kind of working hand in hand in that case. So nitrogen fixing bacteria is one of the ways in which it happens. Another way then it happens in naturally is by lightning. Now if we think here, uh, lightning is uh, so hot and, and so much energy that it actually causes the nitrogen and the oxygen to combine. And we can form nitrates during that process. Also then we have uh, fertilizer. Now of course farmers and, and gardeners put fertilizer on their, their crops and in their soil to add more substances to it. And one of those substances then is nitrates. And we'll come back to them, we'll come back to fertilizers later on in this chapter though. But fertilizers is another way in which we can get nitrates into the soil. So there's three ways in which we're putting nitrates into the soil. The plants then, the plants will absorb the nitrates through the roots. Now that happens by a process called, called active transport, also called active uptake. So that we're saying that nitrates get absorbed into the plants and those nitrates will get converted into a plant protein. So we've got these nitrogen containing compounds have been created then by the plant. Then of course then animals eat the plants and that gets converted into animal protein. So they can now contain substances which contain nitrogen. Now when those plants die or when the animals die, or even when the actual animals uh, pass out feces and urine, what happens is all these substances, they all contain then uh, nitrogen. The first, thing, the first thing which happens, in fact, is that the substances are decomposed. That normally involves then uh, bacteria and fungi. Now, then we have a different kind of bacteria, the nitrifying bacteria, which then converts the ammonia, which is in the dead plants and animals and waste. So the ammonia or the ammonium compounds are converted by the nitrifying bacteria into more nitrates. So we've said then so far, we've got nitrogen fixing bacteria being involved. We now then have nitrifying bacteria being involved as well here. Now, the farmer wants to have as much uh, nitrate in the soil as possible. What he doesn't want is he doesn't want to lose any nitrates. But unfortunately there are bacteria in the soil which does remove the nitrates and put it back into the air. And that bacteria is called denitrifying bacteria. Now again, farmers don't want these to grow. Unfortunately, these grow uh, in different conditions. If the soil, for example, does not have much oxygen in it. So for example, it might be maybe that, that there's been a lot of rain and the rain has filled up the spaces between the soil and there's very little oxygen in the soil. Now there's problems with that. One, if there's not enough oxygen, the plants, in fact, then can't absorb the nitrates as easily. But also the nitrifying bacteria, this denitrifying bacteria, this then will increase in number it will, and will be more active. And what they will do is they're going to take the nitrates out of the soil and put it back into the air again. Okay. Again, we don't want that to happen, but that is something which happens then. So there's different processes involved in the nitrogen cycle. And again, there's three different kinds of bacteria. Nitrogen fixing bacteria, nitrifying bacteria, and denitrifying bacteria. Now your questions and exams will assume your knowledge and will test your knowledge then of these three kinds of bacteria. So that's kind of again what we mean by these then. So we said first of all, we've got nitrogen fixing bacteria. Now it's the one then which converts a nitrogen gas to ammonia. We have then nitrifying bacteria. It converts ammonium from dead plants and animals and from waste into nitrates. The one we don't want then, the denitrifying bacteria converts nitrates back into nitrogen gas. 
So again, we don't want that to happen. And there's my little sad face for that then. So that is the nitrogen cycle. Now, one of the things I also mentioned there is I mentioned that the plants take in then the, the nitrates in. They dig, it, they dig it in through cells called... And another question which pops up quite often then is how are these root hair cells adapted then for, for the absorption of different substances? It's quite clear they have these big long extensions and these big long extensions greatly increases the surface area. So we can say there's, there is a long extension, sometimes we say a finger-like extension, which increases the surface area and therefore we can absorb more nitrates. Now nitrates are absorbed, as I said before, by a process called, called uh, active uptake or else also called active transport. So if we look at what how it happens, I also say then that for this process to take place, there needs to be oxygen present. Now, if we think here, say we've got some nitrates in the soil. Okay, so that's going to put a small N to represent my nitrates. What happens then is those nitrates then will, will need to get absorbed into the plant via these root hair cells. We need to go from where there's a small amount outside to where there's lots inside. Okay, I'm going to indicate that with a big N. So there's less outside than there is inside. Now normally when things diffuse, well, when things diffuse it always goes from where there's lots of a substance to where there's less of a substance. So this idea of, of active transport or active uptake is going in the opposite direction. It's going from where there's less of a substance to where there's more of a substance. And that process requires energy. Now anytime the energy is required, of course, we need to have respiration that requiring. If respiration is, is to require uh, then of course we need oxygen as well here. So basically if the soil becomes waterlogged then there's not enough oxygen in the, in between the soil particles and therefore this process will not take place then. So we're saying root hair cells, what does it do? They need oxygen for respiration so they can carry out active transport. And active transport is a movement of substances from a low concentration to a high concentration against their concentration gradient. So, then there's fertilizers. Now we said, of course, the farmers uh, will put fertilizer onto the field then so as the, the, the plants will grow better. Now specifically, there's, there's different kinds of fertilizers and uh, there's different substances in fertilizers which the plant needs. Now one of those then, uh, in terms of fertilizers, is going to be the nitrates. Of course, we've mentioned nitrates. They're used to make proteins, of course, proteins are used to make growth. Now, other things they need, well, we also then have in there, we also have calcium. Okay, now calcium is required, in fact, to make cell walls. Now, we know cell walls are made of cellulose, and cellulose, in fact, is made of glucose. Now, the cell wall, though, the cell wall has lots of those cellulose strands, and the cellulose strands are kind of glued together by calcium. So again, we've got then this, this calcium which helps us strengthen these cell walls in. The other one we have then is we also then have magnesium. Magnesium is required to make chlorophyll. And of course, without chlorophyll, we can't have photosynthesis taking place. So again, this is something else which pops up in terms of the exams. Now, one of the last things, okay. If we put on too much fertilizer or too much uh, slurry, okay, which of course is natural fertilizer. If we put on too much of this, we can, we can have a very serious problem here. We can get a eutrophication. And eutrophication is something which also pops up in terms of exams, and it could be maybe a five mark question in exams. It's kind of talking about how then, how this increase in fertilizer causes the death of, of fish in the water. Okay, so that's a five mark question, let's see how we're going to explain it. Well, here's the first thing. Here we have a farmer, and the farmer then is spraying his slurry then onto the field. Okay, at the minute outside my house, uh, there's slurry being sprayed recently, not very nice smell, but we have this slurry then. Okay, and obviously it's useful for the farmers because it helps the plants to grow. Now, if it gets very wet, okay, if it rains heavily, for example, some of that slurry, some of that fertilizer will wash off into any neighboring streams and lakes. Even what will happen, in fact, is the fertilizer will dissolve in the water, might then pass through into the soil, pass through the soil into the water table beneath the soil and eventually gets into rivers and streams. Now, there's a word we use here called runoff. 
And runoff is an important word. It's a word the examiners look for then. And this is where you know, the fertilizer is sitting on the surface, it's dissolved in the water, and then runs off in the rivers and streams. So again, it's a word we want to use. Now, as it goes into the rivers and streams, it, of course, it adds in different substances into the, liver, into the rivers and streams, like nitrogen and phosphate. Now, what happens is it goes on into the river. What it happens, in fact, is it starts to, to build up then in, in the water. Okay, and what it does, in fact, then, is it causes then, it causes then a lot then of green material, in this case here, algae, to grow on the surface. And that's called algal balloon. Now, because this is now covering the surface, that means that the light then cannot get then beneath the algae. And therefore, then any plants beneath then the algae cannot get then any any sunlight. Now, if they can't get any sunlight, then of course they cannot photosynthesize. If they cannot photosynthesize, what happens in fact then is that they will start then to die. Now, uh, if they die, then what happens is bacteria comes in, lots of bacteria comes in and reproduces quickly. And what happens is that bacteria starts to decompose then the plants. Now, as the bacteria decompose these plants, then of course they're using up oxygen. If the oxygen levels, if they start to decrease, then of course then what happens is if there isn't enough oxygen in the water, then all of the animals in the water will start to die off then. Okay, and that's what caused the death of these things. So farmers have certain times when they should and should not be, be putting fertilizer on the, on the field. Certainly they want to avoid any time when, when uh, there's a lot of rain forecast then. So that's eutrophication. Now, that's one way in which we, of course, we are, are killing off plants uh, in the water and also killing off then animals in the water. And that, of course, is reducing the biodiversity of the water. What else affects biodiversity? Well, again, there's a few obvious examples. If we chop down lots of trees, then, of course, we are chopping down lots of habitats. So all the animals which live inside the trees, of course, they are losing their habitats and therefore they're beginning to die off. And that's certainly one of the biggest problems we have on Earth is, is humans then destroying lots of habitats. Now, other things we have as well, of course, we're burning more fossil fuels than ever before. All of the appliances that we have at home all require electricity and therefore we need to burn lots of fossil fuels to get electricity. Now still we would like to be moving away from burning fossil fuels, but still at the minute then across the world, most of the electricity comes from burning fossil fuels. Now, other forms of pollution as well, whether it be water pollution, whether it be air pollution, uh, there's lots of other things which we're doing to, to kill off the plants and animals through pollution. And then of course as well, we mentioned already, using excess fertilizers would be a problem as well here. What can we do to try and increase biodiversity? Well, again, a few other obvious examples, we can plant more trees, okay? We plant more trees or else we can use sustainable woodlands where uh, somebody then, the, the people then will, will monitor quite closely then when they chop down different trees. What they might do is they have times and maybe where they chop, might chop down a small amount of the big trees, let the small trees then grow up, keep planting new trees and therefore what happens in fact then is we are removing some of the bigger trees but we're allowing the smaller trees to grow and therefore we are almost like recycling the trees then. So we have what we call sustainable forests or sustainable woodlands. Another example of course is to plant more trees. We know Donald Trump is, is, uh, is certainly not reducing the amount of carbon dioxide going into the air by very much but what his idea is is he wants to plant then a trillion trees to try then and offset the amount of carbon dioxide that America is putting into the air. What else can we do? Of course, we can then avoid using fossil fuels as much. So maybe that could be using public transport rather than cars all the time. Maybe cycling to work rather than than, than uh, using our car. And also, there's there's other initiatives which have been set up globally. In Kyoto Protocol, for example, and, and there was an initiative set up in Paris, 2015, for example. And these are when countries get together and they decide then that they want to try and reduce then the amount of carbon dioxide they're putting into the air and try and reduce the, the increase in the, in the Earth's temperature. That's when kind of countries get together then. So this is that's a bit about ecology uh, and what we need, need to know about ecology then. So year 11, what should you do next? Well, first thing is, is to attempt to fill in the, the eco ecological relationships handout. Now I say attempt because it, it, will, it is quite difficult to fill that one in without too much help in class. Uh, a few things already has popped up. 
uh, the permit of numbers and permit of biomass page is slightly wrong. Um, the top one, you can you can plot the permit of numbers. Um, just leave out the kilojoules part, but just plot the permit of numbers at the top. At the bottom, permit of biomass, probably the easiest way to fix that is simply instead of plotting a permit of biomass at the bottom of that page is to fill this to, to do another permit of numbers graph at the bottom. But again, there are some parts of that which are easy to fill in. If you have a go and you can't fill in some parts, leave out those parts, we'll get those filled in when we get back to school. But there are certainly lots of parts you can fill in. For example, the cycle diagrams near the back, certainly those are quite easy to fill in then. So I do please attempt to fill in those handouts. Now what I'll also do then is, uh, you should have the past paper questions. What I'll do is I'll put those past paper questions online as well in Google Classroom, just in case you don't have those. Uh, do those questions and what you can do then is you can then send those questions back to me via Google Classroom so they can mark them. Now uh, after that, what I can also do then is I'll put the mark scheme on just, just so you know where you went wrong uh, in terms of, of those questions.